Happy Sabbath. For about two weeks, well, Jenny and I were away, two hours away from here, and we stayed there for two weeks, and that was due to the camp meeting, but it's so glad to be back. I missed you. Really, I missed you. You know, it's just like, oh no, every day I needed to wake up 4.30, and I was on a stretch for me, because I'm up by five normally, but was the work ahead of that day, of each single day, and that was heavy. But I was so glad to see some of you there. We were able to fellowship together, share a meal, and if you weren't able to be at Great Lakes Adventist Academy uh, for this past camp meeting, I invite you to save the date for next year, and I look forward to seeing you there. I wanna ask you two favors. One is, if you could look to the person next to you and just shake their hand and say, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Very good. And I am glad that you are here. I'm glad to be here. Second, I would, I would like to, to ask you to pray for me as I share the word that God has placed in my heart, that it will bring fruit both to me and to you as well. I want to invite you to close your eyes and pray with me. Father in heaven, you have loved us and you love us with an everlasting love. And with loving kindness, every single day you draw, you draw nearer and nearer to us so that we may be able to comprehend the riches, the depth, the width, the height, the length of the love that you have for us. Lord, we're about to open your word. I pray that as we open your word, that you may open our hearts, open our eyes so that we may see glimpses of truth that you have for us. Open our ears so that we may hear the truth that you have in store and prepared for each of us. Work in our hearts so that we may be willing to be made willing to do your will. Speak to us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. And as you see on the screen today, the title is Malachi. We'll be studying the book of Malachi. And the focus of the theme of this study is giving God our best. Giving God our best. I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to the last book of the Old Testament scripture. The last book of the Old Testament is the book of Malachi. Malachi is before or comes before the first book of the New Testament, Matthew. And from the end of the book of Malachi to the beginning of the book of Matthew, there is about a 400 years period, which is theologically known as the intertestamental times. It is also known by some as the years of silent. Because during those 400 years, apparently we had no records of a prophet speaking on behalf of God. And before we read and study the book of Malachi today, I want to give you a context to what we're about to read. The title or the name Malachi, the title of the book, derives from the name of the author of the book, Prophet Malachi. Now, Malachi is one of the 12 prophets considered to be the minor prophets. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand. They are not classified of Malachi and Amos and Habakkuk, Haggai, Hosea, and others are not classified as minor prophet because their messages are of minor importance. But rather, because their message is straight to the point and clear. 
And there are 12 of them in the Bible. So Malachi is one of the 12 minor prophets. The name Malachi means messenger. Or from the Hebrew, Malachi means the messenger of Yahweh, the messenger of the Lord. And although little is known about the messenger, Malachi, much is known about the message that he delivers on behalf of God to his remnant people, Israel, that had long returned from the 70 years Babylonian cap captivity, but at this time, the Malachi is writing to them. The remnant people of God had grown apathetic to their divine calling. One would think that after 70 years of captivity, and God brought them back to the land that he promised them, restore them as a people and restore their economy, that the remnant people of God would be fervent, earnest, and devoted to God. But unfortunately, that is not the case when Malachi is writing to the Israelites. By this time, the remnant people of God is in desperate need of revival, spiritual CPR, because they are in their lukewarm, Laodicean state. And if they would not be revived, they would perish in their form of godliness while denying the power of God. From a bird's eye view of the book of Malachi, it is important to note that they, got, they had grown complacent in about four crucial aspects, which are ministry, mission, marriage, and money. In these four areas, they had grown complacent. And God addresses these four areas through his messenger, through his Malachi. And as we study the book of Malachi, which contains four chapters, through a four-part sermon series which begins today, it will, it will be for our good and it will do us best to ponder and pray as remnant people of God today to see what message, to see the message that this book contains and say, God, what is the message that you have for me. For eschatologically, as the book of Revelation tells us, we are the remnant people of God, amen? amen. But the message to the church of Laodicea, which represents us, says that that church is lukewarm, in desperate need of revival. So we are not in a different case, in a different situation, as more than days, remnant people of God. So be praying for it. And I know this message is going to be transformational. The last book of the Old Testament is going to come alive to you. And one Bible commentator commenting, commenting on the state of the, of the people, he says on the screen, the exiles had returned from the land of their captivity to the land of promise. But in their hearts, pay attention to this, in their hearts, they remain in the far country of disobedience and forgetfulness of God. What is he saying? That apparently it is possible to come out of Babylon, but still have Babylon not come out of us. And I'll repeat, apparently, it is possible to come out of Babylon, but still not have Babylon come out of us. And I use that verbiage, that wording, very intentionally because the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, in chapter 18, there is a call to come out of her, my people, come out of Babylon. And the remnant people of God in the Old Testament, the Israelites, God took them out of their 70 years Babylonian captivity, but in their hearts, they still had Babylonian inclinations, Babylonian longings. And so God says, I need to revive my people. So Malachi, my messenger, I have a message for you to deliver to them. So Malachi chapter 1, 
verse 1. We begin the study of chapter 1 today. Malachi, giving God our best. So what's the message that the Lord has to his remnant people? Malachi chapter 1, verse 1, if you're there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 1, it tells us, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Listen to the opening statements of this book. It is a burden. A burden of what? Of the word of the Lord. To whom? To Israel. By whom? By Malachi. It is a heavy word. God knows that his people needs revival. And so he sends a message through his messenger, Malachi. And how does, how does God begin this important message? Verse 2, God says, I have loved you, says the Lord. Can we pause there? Can we pause there and learn from God that when somebody needs rebuke, when somebody needs some correct, correction, God doesn't go straight and say, hey, you. He reminds the people, I love you. I love you. And this beautiful declaration of divine love, unconditional love, is unfortunately met with unbelief and a questioning of doubt. Listen to what they continue to say. And here really comes the format of the book of Malachi. Which format is it? To every statement that God makes, and I want you to, to keep that in mind because we're going to study the next three chapters for the next three sermons. But to every statement that God makes in the book of Malachi, the Israelites object that statement, and then God has to answer that objection. That is the format throughout the book of Malachi. God makes a statement like this one, I love you. And they object the statement. Listen to how they object. Yet you say, in what way? In what way have you loved us, God? Remind me. What way have you loved us? We don't believe you. God is saying, I love you. And they say, no, no, you don't. No, we don't believe you. What way have you loved us, God? Remind me, please. Because apparently I have forgotten. Do you love me, really? And this is sad. Because just the fact that Israel even became a nation is an evidence to God's divine love for them. I want you to see this. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy is the last book of the Pentateuch. We have Genesis, we have Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Chapter 7 of Deuteronomy. And we're going to begin in verse 6. If you're there, please let me know by saying, I'm there. Yes, praise the Lord. So verse 6 of Deuteronomy chapter 7, listen to the word of the Lord through Moses now. And he says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people. Are you following? God is, it's not like God took advantage and said, you know what? The Israelites are stronger, are smarter. Let me be their God. Let me choose them. No, God didn't choose the Israelites because they're larger in number. But they were actually the least of all people. The weakest, the least Yet God set, chose to set his love on them. Verse 8, But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Verse 9, Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. 
It is because of my love, God is saying. God's love has constituted them as a nation from its inception. Without the unconditional love of God, the Israelites would not be rescued from captivity, would not become a nation, and would not be restored as a people. He echoes that love, that unconditional love through the writings of Jeremiah while the people were in Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah 31 verse 3 on the screen, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have thrown you. God didn't love the Israelites because they were larger in number. God simply chose to set his love on them. In other words, God's love is not the effect. It is the cause. No, you didn't follow me. God's love is not the effect, is not the result of them being great, and God loves them. God's love is actually the cause of them being great. So when you look at your life, God's love doesn't come to your life as a result of something great that you have that you, that you have done. God's love is actually the cause of who you are. It's not the result of who you are. It's the cause. Because lamentation, Jeremiah tells us in lamentation, it is only because of the goodness of God, the mercies of God, that we are not consumed. For they're new every morning. Let him remove his mercies. Let him remove his love. We would not exist. His love is not the effect. It is the cause. And why does he lovingly unconditionally goes after and after you and me as he did to the Israelites. Here is the unconditional, universal truth in one line. Are you ready? In one line. The creator of all things loves and wants you. God, the creator of all things, loves and wants you. As broken as you are, he loves and wants you. As forgetful of him as you are, he loves and wants you. He loves and wants you. So back to Malachi chapter 1. God told them, I've loved you, I love you. And they say, what are you saying? In what, in what way do you love us? They object the statement of God, so God now needs to show them and remind them. Continuing verse 2. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated, and laid his mountains, laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. But thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes shall see and you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the borders of Israel. Now I want us, I don't want us to read these verses in an unhealthy way, as if God has favorites. As if God says, you know what, I will love Jacob, but Esau, I don't really like you. I won't love you. I want you to pay attention here. God is answering to their objection. And God then reminds them of the past, of their ancestor. Remember your forefather, Jacob. Remember Esau. Both Esau, Esau and, and Jacob had sinned against God. Jacob was a deceiver, a liar, and Esau did not have regard for his birthright. But something, both of them chose different paths. Jacob repented and continued to follow the Lord. While Esau did not repent, he continued to resist the Lord. And as consequence, the descendant of Esau continued to follow that path of Esau, of resisting God and having, wanting to have nothing to do with, with God. 
while on the other hand, the descendant of Jacob continued to follow the way of Jacob, of seeking God and wanting to be God's people. And so when God is saying, Esau, I hate it, and Jacob, I love, he is not speaking about the person of Esau that he hated, but rather the practices of Esau that he hated. And listen, and, and that's why he shows the practices of the Edomites in verse 4, which are the descendants of Esau. In, the, uh, in an act of defiance, they say, yes, we have been impoverished, but guess what? We're going to rebuild, and we're going to make a name for ourselves in an act of defiance of God. And you know, biblically, that pride goes before what? Destruction. And a haughty spirit before fall. And so God hates a prideful spirit, a prideful heart. But he hates a humble heart, a humble spirit that diligently seeks, seeks him. So God is saying, see how I showed my love to your forefather, Jacob. When he, even though he sinned, he repented, I forgave him. They say, well, yeah, maybe, God. I don't know. So... God continue. And here's really the point. God told them, I love you, but they didn't recognize that. You know why? Because their love for God had grown cold. And when your love and my love for God grows cold, our worship to God became, becomes mere routine, dry formalism, and heavy drudgery. When your love and my love for God becomes cold. Our worship for him becomes just dry formality. Yeah, I'm going to church again. Yeah, here I am. Mm -hmm. Dry. Dry formalism. I'm just going for the sake of going. Just formality. And it is a heavy drudgery. Oh, no. Sabbath again? Oh. And if you're thinking that I'm making this up, just bear with me. We're going to read it. That was exactly the situation that the Israelites were living. That was the reality that they were facing and living. Verse 6, new statement God is going to make. He says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I'm a father, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my reverence? says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name. God is saying, now the Israelites knew very well about honoring your father, honoring the master. They knew that. And so God is saying, you know about honoring father, you know about honoring your master, right? And if I am your father as you call me, Abba, where is my honor? And if I'm your master, where is my reverence? You profess one thing, but you do another. And, and, and I love the Hebrew here in verse 6 where it says a son honors. That word honor in the, in the Hebrew, dabak, it, is, it means to be heavy or be weighty. Now what happens when you carry something that is heavy or weighty? It affects your post posture, doesn't it? It affects the way you walk the way you move doesn't it so it must be when we honor God it must affect the way we walk the way we move the way we carry our lives that's the idea behind the Hebrew word it is something heavy that if you honor God it must show by the way that you walk by the way that you talk by the way that you live your life, it must show the dabak, that you honor God. Where is my honor, God says? Not only to the people, to the priests. To you priests who despise my name. Now, the people said, no, we have nothing to do. No, you don't love us, and we don't honor you. And the priest said, what? The end of verse 6. What are you talking about, God? <laughs> In what way have we despised your name? In what way? The 
before we become so quick to judge the remnant people of God then, let us pause to ponder and let this question permeate our hearts and minds. Are we honoring God? Does your relationship at home and out of home shows that you honor God? Does your department and your conduct shows that you honor God? Or like the remnant of old, you say something, but you do quite another. Are we honoring God in the way that we live our lives? God is calling for a people that will honor him today and always. The priest said, what? What are you complaining about, Lord? In what way have we despised you? In what way? Tell us. Second objection by the priests. God said, really? Okay, let me just give you an example. Verse 7. You offer defiled food on my altar. But you say, in what way have we defiled you? Can you, can you see here the spiritual callous of this, the spiritual leaders of Israel? The people have grown apathetic. The leaders have this spiritual blindness. And not only that, they say, ending of verse 7, the table of the Lord is contemptible. In other words, the sacrifices that we minister here in the temple are worthless. These are the priests of God, the ministers of God. But unfortunately, they are blind. They say it is worthless to serve God. The priest who has been called to serve God and said, here I am, send me. Now he says, you know what? Actually, it is worthless to serve you, God. And God says, isn't that what you do? Isn't that what you do? And here's the thing. The condition, the spiritual condition of the Israelites was a reflection of the spiritual leaders of Israelites. And here's a lesson for me as a spiritual leader here in the house of the Lord at Farmington Seventh-day Adventist Church. Oftentimes, the church will reflect the spiritual leadership of that church. And I'm studying this, I'm like, God, forgive me. Because oftentimes, the church will, uh, will only reflect the spiritual condition of the leader. And the Israelites were reflecting the spiritual condition of the priests. If the priests say serving God is worthless, guess what the people are going to do? Yes, it is worthless. And the truth of the matter is that in this case, of the Israelites and applying it to our church today, the church very seldom will revolt against or rise above the spirituality of its leaders. Rarely, and I repeat, rarely the church will revolt against or rise above the spiritualities of its leaders. And I take it as a responsibility. But it is not just for the church. You are a spiritual leader in the home. Being it a single parent or being a full set of parents. You are a spiritual leader. Father, you are a spiritual leader in the house. And let me tell you the honest truth of the matter. Your children, your family, rarely will revolt against or rise above the spirituality that you show in the house. If you show a weak spiritual life, honestly, it is very possible that their spirituality is going to be weak because of you as a spiritual leader. And later on, you're going to say, God, what happened with my children? What did they do this devil? You were not faithful. You were not faithful. 
And God is calling for leaders in the home today because the church is a reflection of the home. And if in the home we have weak leadership, spiritual leadership, we have weak spiritual leadership in the church. But God forbid that it is our reality. Ian Bond in his book, Power Through Prayer. I just have three or four pages left to finish this book. He says in page 101, 101, times of spiritual leadership are times of great spiritual prosperity to the church. When there is great spiritual leadership in the home, there's going to be spiritual prosperity. When there is great spiritual leadership in the church, there's going to be spiritual prosperity. And you say, how can I be this great spiritual leader in my home, in the church? He continues, Prayer is one of the eminent characteristics of strong spiritual leadership. Be a man of prayer. Be a woman of prayer. And I want to tell you the honest truth that the enemy is coming like a flood after your children. And he's not kidding. He's confusing the mind. Gender identity. He's confusing the mind. Spiritual identity. He's confusing the mind. Guess, do you think he's playing? No, he's not. He knows that his time is running short. And he's going to exhaust all his possibilities to take your children away from the path of the Lord. You've got to wrestle in prayer. Pray intentionally. Pray continually. Pray sacrificially. Don't just pray for them over a meal time. Pray for them in the morning, in the night, in the noon. Put, a cal- put, a, put an alarm on your phone and say, God, I need to pray for my children. Cry and intercede for your children before the Lord. I tell you, it will pay off. It may not look like it right now. It will pay off. My dad was not a, and is not a perfect father. But many of the things that I emulate today and do today in my home, in my marriage, are things that I saw my father doing. Every morning before he was a truck driver when I was home, before leaving home, family worship, 6.30 in the morning. All the kids are up. Let's read the Bible. Some of the the days it was just tiring. And like the Israelites, I said, it is contemptible, worthless to do this. But But father said, let's pray. Let's read. Every single morning, morning, and later it started morning and evening. I left home at age, I just turned 18, and the last thing my dad told me at the airport, international airport in Angola was that he recited Psalms 23. I remember to this day. And I left without promise that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall. Today, the things that I do in my marriage, with my wife, in my personal walk with God are a reflection of the things that I saw my father doing. I never told him that. He never told him to learn from, from me. He just did it because he was the spiritual leader in the home. And great spiritual leadership will be followed by great spiritual prosperity. And praise the Lord, all of his children are in the church. We're not perfect either. But we're there. We have made big mistakes, but we're there. And guess what? He has not stopped praying. I cannot tell you enough, fathers and mothers, pray for your children. Pray for your children. I met a lady in Virginia. I was a Bible worker. Her mom was a faithful attendee, a member of the church. It was a country church in Virginia. And she prayed for her daughter, for 50 years, she never came to church. She passed away. The mother passed away. Afterwards, the daughter started coming to church. She got baptized. Mom went to the grave, not seeing her daughter coming to Christ. But oh, what joy that will be when Jesus will come and their daughter, the daughter will be there and mom will say, what are you doing here? Come here. And she will tell her mom, Mom, the prayers that you prayed for me, they came through. 
you never gave up on me, and the God that you professed never gave up on me. Pray for your children. Pray for your children. Verse 8, and when you offer a blind a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer a lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it to your governors. Would he be pleased with you? Offer. Would he, be, would he accept you favorably, says the Lord? Can you see what's happening here? They're offering the broken, the lame, and the blemished to God. They're taking it to the sanctuary. These are the, the, the people, the Israelites, taking it to the sanctuary. And the priests are supposed to check the offerings, the animals. And the priests say, you know, don't worry, bring the lame. It's okay, we're going to sacrifice anyway. It's worthless to sacrifice it anyway. That's the spiritual condition in the Israelite church. And if you, you know, just in case you're thinking, oh, maybe God is being so particular about things. What, what is he even caring or worrying about these animals? If they're going to die anyway, be sacrificed. Well, come, you know, on the screen. You don't have to go there, but it's on the screen. Leviticus 22, verse 19 to 22. This is the clear direction of God in regards to making an offering. You shall offer of your own free will a male without blemish from the cattle, from the sheep, from the goats. Whatever has a defect, you shall not offer, for it, is, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. Is it clear? Yes or no? Continuing, and, when, and whoever offers a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow, or a free will offering from the cattle or of the, ship, the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Those that are blind or broken or maimed or have an ulcer, eczema, or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar of the Lord. Very clear. God says, don't offer broken, blind, bruised, and blemished. Why is that, God? Well, first of all, what does this, what, what did the sacrifice point to? Christ, the perfect Lamb of God that was sacrificed for us to take away the sin of the world. That includes my sin, includes your sin. Second of all, the sacrifices was a way, a form of worship. When you brought your sacrifice to the temple, you were worshiping God and also humbling yourself, saying, I need the atonement of God, which those sacrifices pointed to. But when you bring the lame, the broken, and the bruised, you know what? They're actually saying, I'm not that bad. I don't really need you know, that much to be atoned. A blind one will do. Take it. Take it. But God says, sure. But before you do that, just a quick question. Take it to your governors. Will he be pleased with you? You know, take those leftovers to your governors. Will he be pleased with you? Oh, no, definitely not. So why are you bringing it to me? Where is my honor? Where is my reverence? Where is my respect? If you don't do it to your governors, why would you do it to me? What have I done? All I've done is loving you. And that's how you treat me? And here's where things started just, you know, hitting me in my heart. Because we are so concerned about giving our best at our workplaces. We don't come late at work because we're going to be charged. We don't, we, 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 we give our best in our families. We give our best in the things that we want to do. And, and here's the honest truth. There is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with you wanting to be on time at your workplace, be great with your family and, and the things that you want to do. That's great. Keep doing it. There's nothing wrong. But the problem is, when you give your best to your workplace, you're there on time. You give your best to your family and the things that you want without giving your best to God. Actually, in reality, you will see 
And time will come when you realize that all the best that you gave at your work, at your family, and the things that you want are not good enough. And when people don't appreciate you, you say, but these people don't appreciate me. I give them my sweat and blood. You switch priorities, that's why. That's why. We give our best at our workplaces because we're afraid. I need to, to punch in. But because we don't punch in with God, like the priest and the people, we say, it is contemptible, it is worthless. Who cares? I'll be there anyway. The only point is that I came to church at least. Don't talk me bad. Don't look at me bad. Well, none of us will. But God says, go and do that to your workplace. Will your boss be happy? Go and do that to your firm. Will your, will your firm be happy? To your family, will they be happy? So why are you giving it to me? Silence. But Malachi puts a parenthesis and say, but now, verse 9, entreat God's favor that, you may be that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hand, will he accept you favorably, says the, the Lord of hosts? Could you just please repent? Can't you see that we should not give our leftovers to God? Because here's the truth of the matter. When we put God first and give him our best, he will give us the strength to give our best at our workplaces, to give our best in our families and the things that we do. And we will have joy that lasts rather than happiness that is temporary. Give your best to God. Try and see if he will not give you the strength. If you will not uplift you and sustain you when you're tired in that heavy work week, he's going to give you strength to endure. When you say, God, I know I have a busy week, but I'm going to give you my worship from sundown to sundown on Sabbath. I'm going to come to your church on time. Even though there is no clock for me to punch in, I'll be there. Not because of the pastor, not because of the elders or the deacons, because I have a commitment with you. But the people say, it's worthless. I don't care. <laughs> and Malachi said, could you please, could you please repent? Because if you continue in this path, it's going to lead you to destruction. Can you repent? There is time today. Can you give God your best and not give him the leftovers? But God Verse 10 says, who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that, when, so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. God is saying, is there a faithful priest at least that would just close the doors of the sanctuary, of the temple? Because I would rather have no offering. I would ha rather have no worshipers than having half-hearted worshipers. Now I want you to understand that God is not speaking to new converts, to people that are just learning about the truth, okay? God is speaking about his covenant people, people that have a relationship with him that said, Lord, speak and we will do. These are people that have grown up in the church, people that have said, here I am, send me. Lord, I'm here, I'll serve you. These are the people that God is speaking to. So is a father speaking to his children, He said, I would rather have no worship at all, no sacrifice at all. Please, somebody, close the doors. That's enough. To God, to reach this point, the people are in desperate need of spiritual CPR, revival. But God says, verse 11, from the rising of the sun even to the going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name, and a pure offering from my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So here's what God is saying. I chose you, Israelites, to be my covenant people, to spread and carry my name through all, to the other nations. But if you don't want to do it, guess what? It's okay. My name will still be great. 
Sometimes we think, well, if I don't show up, it won't work. God said, oh, look at him. Being so full of himself. <laughs> Do you really think? First of all, you, you found, when you were born, you found my work. <laughs> you die and you leave my work. The point is, with you or without you, God says, verse 11, my name shall be great. I would love to have you part of my mission, but if you don't want to, it's okay. My name will still be great. And this is something that must lead the remnant people of God. Everybody that professes to be a follower of God to be on their knees and say, God, forgive me. Instead of rebelling like Esau and his descendants did. Esau and his descendants said, we don't care. We will build our own things. We'll do our own things. But God said, you will be destroyed. I'm just telling you. Because there's a man that seemeth right unto a man. But the end is the end of destruction. They have forsaken the ministry, the mission. And we continue verse 12. But you profane it. In that you say the, ta the table of the Lord is defiled. It is, its fruit and food is contemptible, worthless. That's what they're saying. We don't have to sacrifice these things. All these sacrifices are worthless. Even though they knew that it is pointing to Christ. Verse 13. You, sh you also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. They literally say, oh my, going to church on the Sabbath, what a weariness. Oh my. Oh, 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 reading my Bible every day, doing a devotional, praying, what a weariness. And they snare at it. They blow it off and say, oh, shh, stop it. That's the condition of the people. Remaining part of the verse 13, and you bring the stolen, the sick, the, the lame, the sick, thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? No, they weren't just bringing the broken, the bruised, the blind, and the blemish. They were bringing the stolen, the stolen to God. They were like, oh, no, no, my sheep is healthy, but that one. Belongs to my neighbor. I ah, sickly and lame. I'll steal that one and I'll sacrifice that one. And they bring it to God. And unfortunately, some of us have been offering to God stolen sacrifices. Lame and blind worships. Ministry. God is saying, please, my people, one more message I'm giving to you to my, through my messenger. Return to me. Put me first. You see, when, when, when humanity fell into sin, in the council of divinity, somebody needed to go and rescue humanity. And God did not send one of the least of the angels to say, hey, hey, you, the angel, back there. You know, Adam and Eve just fell. Can you go there, die for them? We'll sustain you from up here. That's not what God did. God gave his best. God gave himself his life. What do we give in return? Today we don't need to go to the temple and sacrifice no longer because Jesus, the Lamb of God, will sacrifice once for all to take away our sins. But Paul, in Romans 12, verse 1, in view of the great mercies of God, he exhorts us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. And sometimes we forget that, yes, Jesus was sacrificed for us, but we are living sacrifices. What sacrifices are you giving with your life? What sacrifices are we giving with 
our lives. Put God first and don't rob God. Verse 14 and last, but curse be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. Are you seeing here? So this worshiper has the best to give to God, but he, and he, he says, oh God, I'm going to sacrifice to you. But he actually goes and sacrifices what is blemished. When he has the possibility of offering the best, and God says, cursed is that person. And so here is the divine truth. That a curse will be pronounced to those who having the possibility of offering God their best. Choose instead to offer the blind, the bruised, the blamed, and the blemished. And I'll repeat. Because we are supposed to be living sacrifices. And God pronounces a curse to those who have the possibility of giving God their best. Yet they choose instead to give God the bruised, the broken, the blind, and the blemish. A judgment will fall. Heavy truth, but that is the truth. Biblical truth. And see the point. It's not that he or she does not have the possibility of giving the best. The Bible is saying, verse 14, he has in his flock... A male, he has a possibility of giving the best, but he chooses instead to give the worst, the blemish. And as far as I can tell, all of us here have the possibility of giving God our best. We are alive, we can move, we can hear, we can see. We have the possibility of giving God our best. But there will be a judgment upon us if us having the possibility of giving God our best in worship and ministry and serving God in our devotion, we choose rather to give him the leftovers. If we didn't have, God would understand, and his Bible supports that. But if we have, and we choose to give the blemish instead, the broken, the blind, and the blemish, God says, there's, there's, there will come a day when judgment will fall upon you. And it, he ends saying, for I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. God's people must reverence God and honor him. And remember, to honor in Hebrew means heavy or weighty. And when you carry something heavy that affects your posture, the way you move, the, the way you carry your life, so it must be when we honor God. When you say, I want to honor God for my life, it must show in your life. It must show in your deportment. It must show in the way that you carry your life. It is, ta it is time to stop beating ourselves as if we do not have the best to give and making ourselves believe that we don't have the best. I just don't have time. I just, I just can't. I'm too busy. And say, God, I have been sinning against you. And follow verse 9's Malachi's recommendation. To entreat God's mercy. To pray. So you may say, how can I give God my best? Three ways in closing to help us give God our best. Number one, remember the, Lord, the love of the Lord. That's in verse 2. God says, I love you. Remember the love of God. You give your best to God because God has given you his best. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. His best. What are you giving in return? Steps to Christ. I recommend you reading this book. It's Fundamental is important. If you have read it, read it again because it's going to revive you. Those who feel the constraining love of God, do not ask how little may be given to meet the requirements of God. Spiritual minimalism. How little can I do? Can I come just uh, maybe 
20 minutes into Sabbath school and uh, uh, maybe at the end of the service, at least I came, how little can I give? Oh, oh, oh prayer meeting, oh, no, I can't give that. That's too much. My week is my week. I'll give God only the Sabbath. They ask, how little can I give? But those who feel the constraining love of God, those that remember the love of the Lord, do not ask how little may be given to meet the requirements of God. They do not ask for the lowest standards, but aim at perfect conformity to the will of their Redeemer. With earnest desire, they yield, they yield all and manifest the interest proportionate to the value of the object which they seek. And here's the truth, the cutting, the two-edged sword truth. A profession of Christ without this deep love is mere talk, dry formality, and a heavy drudgery. Remember the love of the Lord. Number two, and that is from verse 9, from the book of Malachi chapter 1, repent. Entreat the Lord's mercies and favor and he will be gracious to us. Number three, reverence the king. Honor him. And let it be shown in the way that you live, the way that you carry your life, the way that you deal with your spouse, with your children in the home, the way that you carry your life outside of the home. Let it show that you are a man that fear God, a woman that honors God. God says in verse 14, I'm a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name shall be feared, shall be reverenced among the nations. Three ways to help us give God our best. Remember the love of the Lord. Repent and reverence the king. When we do this, as the remnant people of God living in these last days of hurt history, we will experience great spiritual prosperity in our families, in the church, and wherever we go. But we need to give our best to the master. It is time to repent. And I want to start, God, and say, God, repent. I, 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 I repent. Forgive me, God. You know what I say? I want to, meet, I want to be a man of spiritual power. And so I committed myself to pray for you by name. And I've been praying for you by name. I go through the, the list, praying for you by name. Because the enemy is not willing to let you go. And I say, God, if we are to conquer in this great controversy, I need my church family. And I'm lifting them up in prayer. And please lift me up in prayer. For I also need the prayer of those I love. But we need to give our best to the master. Give the best that we have. Put him first, and the rest he will add to us. Is it your desire to give God your best? To say, God, I, I recognize that to some extent I haven't been giving you my best. And, and this is about me and you, not about what pastor is saying. Not about, it's about me and you. I recognize from the, the, the secret place of my heart, I recognize that I haven't been the, giving you the best as the spiritual leader of my home and as a member of your church, as a people that believes you. I recognize that I haven't been giving you my best. But today, oh God, like verse 9 of chapter 1 of Malachi says, I want to entreat your grace and your favor. Forgive me, God, and give me the power to give you my best and put you first in the church and out of the church. If it is your desire, I want to invite you to stand. And you feel the convicting power of God to say, George, you need to give me my, your best. Praise the Lord. Heaven and earth records this day when me Along with my church family, we say, God, we want to give you our best. And when we are tempted to slack and fall short, empower us, sustain us with the power of the Holy Spirit, God. We know that it is not by power, not by might, but by your spirit, says the Lord. 
That's the only way that we will be able to help our children to conquer the evil one. That is the only way that we'll be able to conquer the evil one ourselves. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. And the enemy wants us to perish with him, but we don't want. You already gave us your best, oh God. And we want to give you our best starting today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing as we sing.